Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're all here because we love NPR, I assume. Some stylized visuals, is that right? Or not, I guess. Jeez, all right. Um, well, that's what I'm talking about, so if you're in the wrong place, you better get out of here. Uh, my name is Wyatt Hall. I'm a director and animator based out of Los Angeles. When I started my animation company, Winter Stellar Studios, we were animating in Maya and then exporting Alembics to come into Blender for render. And part of that was because most of the animators at the time that I knew, they knew Maya. Um, but from the beginning, Winter Stellar has focused on stylized animation. And for that reason, it was always my dream to run the entire 3D pipeline completely in Blender. Back when 2.8 released, I'd already been following Blender for a really long time, and uh, the performance and the usability and the features and everything that made 3D NPR viable for a small company like us, it was just simply too great to pass up. Uh, so today, I am happy to say that we successfully released our first Blender animation project and our first original IP called Samurai Blue After Image. Um, and I'll be talking about it a lot in this presentation. That's a shot from it. Um, remember that shot, we'll come back to it at the end. But before I go too much further, I really want to give a big shout out to the Goo Engine team from Dylan Goo Studios. Uh, Dylan Goo Stu and late as usual, like the whole team, they released this fork of Blender called Goo Engine. What it does is basically it modifies Eevee to be more curated for NPR rendering. A lot of the techniques I'm going to cover in this presentation at the time were only possible in Goo Engine, and I'll point them out when they come up. So this presentation, like I said, is mostly going to focus on some of the techniques we used in my short film to get our, to render our really cool stylized anime-inspired visuals. I'll start out by explaining a little bit about how we plan and ideate concepts in pre-production, um, and then we'll dig into environments a little bit, show you some techniques and cool things for that. Then we'll get into characters, and finally, I'll do a brief overview of how I composite all of that in After Effects. Um, and at the very end of the talk, we'll come back to that first shot that I showed you guys on, a, on the cover page, um, and I'll break down some of our essential render passes and AOVs into how we bring all of that together. So to start things off, planning, concepting. Um, I think we spent a little bit extra time in this stage than a typical 3D production partly because we wanted our 3D assets to match our 2D designs as closely as possible. Therefore, we needed to be flexible and allow enough of time for experimentation to find our unique art style, one that blended the best of 2D and 3D mediums. So to start with, we went scouting, just like any good film project does. Um, fortunately, Samurai Blue is a story based and inspired on the street racing and car culture in Los Angeles. Um, even though it's a very stylized and emotionally driven story, I really wanted to ground it as authentically as possible in those real world aspects. So that anyone who is a car person could look at us and say like, wow, that's exactly what it feels like to go fast or like to be in the zone. Um, so to achieve that, we went on a location scout to places where like car people actually go to drive their cars fast, way up in the mountains where it's super dangerous. Um, and when we went up there, we actually found like you can see in that the kind of sunset picture right there. We actually saw car people like with their Porsches and their GT86 is out there kind of running the canyons. Um, we knew we were in the right place there. And so we focused on getting a feeling, getting the vibe of what this place is, all the little, you know, everything down to the graffiti on the street signs or the, the, the bird shot through the street signs and the, and the way that the cliffs, the steepness of everything in the fog and the air and the mountains and everything, maybe smog. It is at Los Angeles, so. Um, once we got that feeling, then we took everything, we went and assembled a lookbook. This was a really fast way that allowed us to quickly study artistic techniques, 3D or otherwise, that we felt could help tell the story. Uh, some of these were things that I was sure we could achieve, and others were going to be experiments. I especially, I really wanted to get these really beautiful, like, hand-painted light beams, kind of volumetrics, but they're, like, with the really chalky kind of brush. Um, we saw that those are from, that's a screenshot from Kill a Kill. Um, also, shout out to Lightning Boy Studios. He did this breakdown of uh, the way that Arcane kind of paints light, and he highlighted the way in which, along Shadow Terminators, 
uh, you kind of have extra saturated colors. And so that's something that I wanted to, to really try as well. But your lookbook is also an opportunity to point out things that you don't want to do. So something that I didn't want that didn't match the tone or the vibe was really kind of bright, overly saturated pastel colors or tune shading on the background, kind of like this image over here. Um, so definitely while you're assembling a lookbook, it doesn't have to just be things you think are cool. You're trying to distill a style into something. So and set yourself up so that you can go out and start creating your own stuff. And we made this big image. This is our key visual. If you don't know what a key visual is, it's a central dominant image or artwork that effectively conveys the main theme, mood, or concept of a design or campaign. I got that from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. <laughs> um, but really the point is here just to keep yourself focused. This is the first kind of painting that you get that you're like, okay, I'm establishing the style, which is the colors, the shape language, the effects, the lighting, what it's gonna feel like. So we took that, and here is the 3D shot that it turned into. This was like months down the line, um, and with a keen eye, you may notice that we actually, we reused the actual kind of background mountains from the, key, from the painting, from the actual illustration in the background here. Um, this shot is from the film itself, and we can see it it's actually in, it's in this shot, and we just kind of peel some of these layers away. Um, keep going, keep going, there it is. It's in the background all blurred out where you, you can't even tell. <laughs> um, but for the purposes of example, it's really easy for me to show you this final image and show you how all the component pieces fit together, but you have to remember that when you're starting out on this journey of making a film, you don't really know what your final image is going to look like. You have like this concept art for sure, and that it gets you going in the right direction. But you still, you don't exactly know how all the pieces are going to fit together. And that's part of like the fun of the journey, I think. Um, but what we knew for sure is that there was going to be a pretty drastic stylistic separation between our character rendering and our environment rendering. So taking that into account, I always plan to get my final image in comp because that's where your color correction and your shadow masks and your lighting effects can be applied to the characters in a stylized way to make them look like they inhabit the same environment as the background. So light linking, light passes are really super important. Even at this super early stage, I can recognize I'm going to need to completely separate my characters and my lighting, um, or my characters and my environments. Um, not just on separate render passes or with mats, but also with lighting. To that end, as I start building assets, I consider what group they need to be lit from, the character pass or the environment pass. Um, for example, also, we can get even more granular. The character's headlights are different from their body lights, um, and that just gives us a little bit extra level of control to make sure that um, they always look good. Um, you could achieve light linking in regular Blender, like but it becomes a little bit of a headache because you're either dealing with a bunch of view layers and kind of rendering your scene twice every single time, um, or you're doing that hack version where you have, um, like all your lights are either red, green, or blue, and you have like a separate uh, XYZ or separate color node in your shader that like grabs the red, green, or blue light. Um, it's a very annoying way to do it. But uh, fortunately, Goo Engine actually gave us light linking in Eevee. Um, and that was a huge boon because having just an elegant solution like that that's just kind of purpose-built was way, way easier to work with. Um, so environments. All our environments need to be on the same light pass. Good. That's an easy place to start with. We'll worry about characters later. We'll come back. So just like pretty much everything else, as long as we're trying to emulate 2D, I'll always try to involve as much 2D in the process as possible. Uh, most, if not every asset, begins as a 2D concept, uh, some you might not even expect. Like, obviously, we've got up there, like, those kind of, you know, texture ideas for, um, like, the headlights or, like, grass and stuff like that. But also, we're, like, talking about things like the headlights of the cars because, remember, I really wanted to get the, that kind of hand-painted look to light rays um, from our lookbook. Well, we did some concepts like, how does the light look on the road if it was gonna be painted? So we did a whole sheet of ideas for it. And then we started trying to make it work in 3D. This is basically like up there at the top, that's the actual texture that we used. Um, and then it's just basically like, it lives in the environment shader because it has to be applied to everything in a scene. 
Um, and it's just like a single image instanced twice with a little bit of separate mapping mapped to the coordinates of empties that follow the car. And then it drives around. And there are lights involved in order to get the cast shadows working right. Um, and there's other lights involved. And then there's other empties involved to make it like kind of glow and have the bloom it needs to have and everything. Um, so it's kind of a fun mix between some procedural stuff, um, some empty kind of coordinate mapping stuff, and then um, just actual image painting and everything. It's actually super helpful to have that concept art, though, because I can go into the Photoshop file and be like, all right, what did my art director, like, what blending mode did he use to get it to look right on the road? And it's like, oh, that's an overlay. Okay, sweet. I can just, you know, add a mix node, overlay this texture onto this with this color. Boom. And now it, like, matches almost perfectly. Here's another example of kind of using these sort of cast light textures. Um, if I get rid of the, the people there, 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 there they go. So you can see now there's kind of those, like, cool painterly shapes being cast on the ground. That's just an image texture that is um, masking a, a light group. And then it's also, again, kind of over by the cars and everything. Um, something you might notice in there is we're using this fun edge blending trick. Hey, we've got our, our other thing from the lookbook. Um, we're achieving things. Let's go. This is a, we're basically, instead of kind of making them more orange, like Lightning Boy kind of did in their arcane breakdown, we're making them more blue. Since this is a nighttime scene, it just makes sense to kind of have everything tint into blue in the shadows. Um, I also feel like it's kind of cinematic, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's essentially just kind of color ramping along the shadow terminators. It's a little less um, obvious to tell along the, the like tight edges, but if you squint, it's there, I promise. Um, so we were successful in achieving one of, these, one of these looks. But speaking of painted light, I freaking love lens flares. They just look so cool. <laughs> um, but, and especially with this film being at night, lens flares are going to be huge. Like if you're talking cinematically, like if you were gonna go shoot a car, um, you would be shooting on a very wide open lens and all of the light is going to be pouring into it. It's gonna be super bloomy and just like um, looking cool in the lens. And so I really wanted these flares to be a standout piece and like uh, kind of a hallmark of, of our style. So. Like you saw on the last slide, just went into Photoshop, painted a bunch of different flares, and then we basically tracked and added all of these manually in comp. Um, and hey, like now we're cruising. We managed to do two of the more experimental things from my lookbook that I wasn't sure we'd be able to do, but unfortunately, now we had, I had to work on rocks. <laughs> um, Concept art for these was originally called for this very graphic style, very bold shapes. Um, and while I had time for experimentation, I didn't have unlimited time. Uh, I wanted the film to come out eventually. So making every rock asset by hand was out of the question. But maybe I could achieve this look, like if I, maybe if I grab a, an asset or something and, you know, looking at this stuff, it kind of looks like maybe a planar decimation modifier could just kind of flatten all these shapes out and make some cool kind of graphic shape language. So I thought, you know, our early tests were kind of promising, but when I applied this to like other larger assets or like almost a whole scene, it started to break down and uh, my art director had notes. He was like, he was like, oh, this is just, this is a weird shape right here. He was like, I would never draw this. And ah, oh, this rim lighting is in the wrong place. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Um, back to the drawing board. So really the goal kind of is to make things more painterly, right? So we put our heads together and we thought, well, maybe if we just throw a bunch of brush strokes in the scene, um, that like on scatter planes and just put like thousands of little planes all every surface and they all have a brush stroke texture on them, maybe that would look cool. And we tried that, um, but we realized that it looked a little too random um, and it didn't give the illusion of artist's intent that we were really looking for. It was just a little kind of messy looking to us. But shout out to Alan Wyatt, the Tradigitalist, who is a really awesome geometry nodes wizard. And he kind of developed a whole like illustrative shader geometry nodes like brush scattering uh, system. And it's very impressive, but it wasn't right for our project. But you might be thinking like, okay, well, if 
if scattering a bunch of brushstroke textures doesn't give you the artist's intent, whatever that means, um, what if you just did it manually? And I tried that. I did a project a few years ago where I went into VR and I painted every environment in the film by hand in tilt brush. Um, it's a really cool, interesting experiment, a cool look. Um, but after spending like day after day for months in VR, I think my eyes and my neck have had enough of that. Um, I don't think I would go back to it, honestly. Um, but I wanted to mention it because it, the thought crossed my mind. Uh, so we ended up abandoning matching the graphic shapes entirely. And we went back to grabbing an asset and we said, what can we do with this? We opted for hand painted textures. Uh, sponge brushes and rake brushes are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in our art style. Um, and it looks pretty good. Um, we arrived at a library of assets that I basically used to make every environment. Fun fact, those two on the ends are actually photo scans from the location that we visited in real life. Um, so, of course, using hand-painted textures isn't that far off from camera projection. Uh, and indeed, we use that on some specific assets like the shrine here. Uh, if you don't kind of know, like it, it, if you've ever heard of a, like what Ian Hubert does where he takes an image and then he just kind of extrudes off of it, like it's basically like that, except instead of a photo, you have like just an artist's painting. Um, and it, I think it looks really good. It achieves a very rich hand-drawn style, um, very visually interesting. Um, and of course, you can do this on full environments as well. We produced a project in partnership with the 2D animation studio, Studio Leaf. Um, and in this, we got to do some really fun, like all projection mapping shots. Uh, the characters in this are fully 2D animated. Um, and then they gave us the layout. And then I gave them 3D layout. And then they gave me full 2D paintings that are just gorgeous. And I reprojected them back into 3D and we comped them with the characters. Um, that's a really fun pipeline. I think it looks beautiful um, because you're working with like just 2D artists at the top of their game. Um, uh, but something that I often notice when working with 2D artists is their liberal interpretation of light. So obviously I don't have the budget to hire 2D background illustrators to go in and paint every camera angle of my film. Um, I have a lot of camera angles in my film. That would be a lot of money. But maybe by studying their technique, I can kind of find a way to mimic it. Um, so 2D illustrators will often use this kind of gradients to suggest shading rather than actual be like photorealistic. Um, this is especially true for characters, but it's also present on environments. And you can see here, like we've got that image up at the top. That's just kind of basically someone going in with a really soft brush and being like, hey, it needs to be darker here. And oh, it needs to be a little lighter here, you know, just like effects layers in Photoshop. And then those get either added or multiplied onto the final image. And like, it's like, wow, that, that pops a, a lot more. And maybe you're sitting there thinking it's the same picture, but, but no, trust me, it's a little, it's a little bit better. And it's that little bit that counts. Uh, the good news is that we can kind of mimic that in Eevee natively, um, you can just turn down the shadow resolution <laughs> so that it's like really small and then you get very soft shadows. And I actually use this on our, on a past project called Colorville um, when I didn't want to do like hard edge shading on these characters because, because I didn't want to spend the time to actually normal edit them. But the soft shading, it gives the suggestion of depth as opposed to like the proof of it. Um, it, this kind of makes me wish that Eevee could render two shadow passes because I still want crisp shadows. I still want like, especially for tune shading, you need really high resolution shadow textures. But having like a very nice kind of soft, very diffuse shadow, it doesn't have to be physically accurate at all. That is appealing to me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever thought of that before. Um, and it is kind of a hack, but whatever. So stylized foliage. Plenty has been said about how to make like anime trees or foliage or whatever on YouTube and everywhere else. So I won't waste any time here, but I will say that I think the way we've implemented it on Samurai Blue specifically is a little unique. Um, and this is Goo Engine specific. So that node way up like right above me, it's the curvature node. Um, if you know what turning on um, 
the like cavity and edge shading in uh, Workbench is. It's basically that, but like ported to Eevee. Um, and it's pretty handy. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the scene rim output, which you can think of as Fresnel, but it's not because it's not calculating the like angle of the face to the camera. It's calculating the actual um, silhouette of an object in the, in the 3D space. And it uses depth to do that. Um, and since it uses depth, we can use that to basically have access to the screen, to the amount of screen space that an object is taking up. So look carefully, because here I'm gonna explain like why I'm actually doing this. So in this one, see how there's like all the shading in the grass and as I zoom out, it becomes just kind of one color. That's the whole purpose. Because when I'm looking at something from really far away, in an illustrated image, an artist isn't gonna go in and like add the shading between every blade of grass or every like, like leaf or anything. Um, but up close, they might want to. And so with the access to the screen space um, like information here, it gives, it just automatic, it basically automatically gives us the detail where we want it and not where we don't want it. Um, but, and screen space, I'll just kind of reiterate really fast is important here because it's not the distance to the camera. It's the amount of the screen that an object is taking up. Because if you can imagine, you can have a camera that's really far away from something, but it's on a super tight lens and you're like zoomed way in on something. It's like, well, you're going, if, you, if you're doing based on camera distance, you're going to have the wrong LOD. So um, that's pretty sweet. In the future, we didn't use it on this project, but in the future, we're actually going to combine this with proper billboarding. Um, what is billboarding? That's a game dev term, um, I think. That's what they told me in college. Basically, it just means that the, a plane is always facing the camera, like no matter what. Um, and um, why isn't this like a default thing for particles in the normal particle like uh, system in Blender? Like I know you can do it in geometry nodes now, but it was only in 4.1 that they actually gave us the active camera node. And that's essential for if you have a scene with more than one camera and you have like them bound to markers and you're flipping through a bunch of different shots in a scene, um, it would be impossible or not impossible, but it would be impractical to go in and keyframe a geometry nodes attribute to change like the target of every like camera in your shot. Um, so the active camera thing does it by default, but it would be really nice if all the planes could just always face the camera uh, if they're part of a particle system. Blender people, Blender developers, please. Please. Um, I don't want to go through geometry nodes just to have a plane face a camera. Uh, that's, that's a big uh, game engine thing that is in a lot of them. But anyway, I'm, I got off track, but it just, it looks better, right? I'm, I'm not... Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, it, here, so here's, here's why, really. Um, when you're going into Photoshop, like, because we're trying to emulate 2D styles, right? If you go into Photoshop, um, someone's going to be painting with a 2D brush. It's going to be like a picture of uh, a leaf or something like that. And they're just kind of going to be going in there and being like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. like I, have a, I have to paint a bazillion leaves in like 30 minutes. Um, and, and they do it with some blending and it just, and it looks really nice, but no one is going to go in and like, skew the, this a single like leaf texture. So by billboarding it, we actually, we get a little bit closer to that 2D look because we're constraining everything to the space in which the camera is looking at it. Um, this is super easy in geometry nodes. Like I just said, you can set it up with the active camera node and like you subtract the position or the, it, it, you subtract like the rotation from the position or, or something. And then you it, align Euler to vector. That's the node that you need to remember, align Euler to vector. And then you plug it in and I don't know, look up a tutorial. Um, we're using this on a, <laughs> we're using this on a new um, uh, project. It's really good for effects also. Um, you can see kind of the, the gun down there. Like obviously the muzzle flash is in, is three dimensional, but the like kind of sparks that kind of fly off of it and everything that, that's always billboarding to the camera. And that's just a procedural solution that makes it so easy to move really fast. Um, so smudging is another 2D inspired tool that we put together. Um, this is pretty simple. It's just a material basically that looks at what's behind it and it blurs it and it displaces it just a little bit kind of based on how you draw it. Um, you just take a curve 
and then you can draw in your scene and you can see me, I'm like drawing around all over the scene there. This is, the purpose of this is just to break up those crispy 3D edges um, because we want our environments to look more painterly. That means maybe we have to, we don't need like super, super crisp edges everywhere. Um, here's another look exactly at kind of what it's doing since it, it was hard to see in that last GIF, I know. Um, and you can see how we're basically like, it's not like making the cube out of focus, it's just kind of giving a little bit of softness to all of the edges. Um, and the cool thing is that since this is an alpha blend material, it shows up in the transparent pass specifically. So that makes it really easy to isolate and then adjust for further like color correction or further effects or whatever. Um, Something that I really want to improve with this is the way that the curve just kind of intersects with the mesh willy-nilly. Um, if anybody has any ideas on how to do that, that are easy, I'm all ears. <laughs> um, here's another hack that I like to do. Um, I like to bake ambient occlusion maps and then do something like this. It's a blur node hack. Basically, you can just mix the, a noise texture with a really high scale with like the UV mapping to something and then plug it into the image texture and it, it blurs it. And so you can see like this motorcycle, it starts out with like really nice baked ambient occlusion right there, that's the baked ambient occlusion, and then it blurs and it's like kind of um, I equate this to, if you've ever seen a 2D illustrator kind of take a lasso tool and like select an area in Photoshop and then either take a gradient or just a really soft brush and kind of put a stroke through it. Now they have like a really soft side and a really hard edge side. And when the blurring of your baked texture butts up against the UV holes, that's where you get like a soft side and a hard side. So it's an interesting, uh, experiment that I think I will keep around. Um, so moving on to characters, I'll cover some techniques that we're talking about them. Um, I'll cover some modeling things and then some shadow control and normal editing things. And then we'll touch on stepped animation and I'll get to AOVs. Sound good? All right, all right, all right. Uh, so like everything else, we start in 2D. Um, I often see modelers, they'll, or not, uh, designers, they'll draw a character in T-pose and then they'll like model tracing the T-pose. That's really, really good like practice and it's also good like to start modeling a character, but that's not a character design as far as I'm concerned. A character design needs to foremostly give you a sense of the character of the character. So we do all our designs, when we're doing our designs, we're also doing like expression tests and just like fun drawings to figure out like what they're gonna look like and how they're going to act, not just um, how they should be modeled. Because ideally, like you wanna give these things to the animators as a reference. Like this character is cute and fun and this character is kinda, kinda stoic and they glare a lot. Um, so controlling character shadows, the first thing you realize when you put a tune shader on a model is how little control over the shadows you actually have. There are several ways to control shadows. I will cover the ones that we used and are experimenting with. Uh, this one is super easy. You just directly edit the normals. Um, in edit mode, Alt-N, copy vector, Alt-N, paste vector. It's that simple. Um, we specifically, in order to figure out kind of what shapes we wanted on these characters, we did like a contact sheet where I just kind of went in and drew shapes of the of the shadows and then I handed that to my modeler and was like, is this possible? And he was like, we'll see. <laughs> um, but what he discovered is that it's super important to actually kind of draw the shapes in your topology because it's along all of the edges and like the flow of the edges that you're going to get those crisp, uh, nice ter uh, shadow terminators. Um, then like you've got, you can't, I said it was easy, I promise it's still easy, but you can't just edit the normals on the actual mesh you're going to be animating on. You're going to have to copy them from a proxy mesh. So here we have two different types of proxy meshes. One of them is just kind of more of a radial projection and the other one is actually just kind of a flat projection. Um, and both of these can be, we can switch between either of those normal types, but 
Um, both of these, uh, the, the mesh on the character actually is using a data transfer modifier that targets one of those um, and actually copies the normal information from them. The reason you need to do that is because if you animate a character whose normals are directly modified, those normals are going to be then translated further by the animation of the character and your shading is going to break down. But if you are using a data transfer modifier, it is going to take the normals locally from the proxy mesh every time you update and then put those on the mesh that is deforming so they're not going to change. Uh, but sometimes you need like a get out of jail card because your normals, uh, your normal meshing is, is just, it's not giving you the detail you want or you need like an extra shadow to come in or, or for whatever reason, um, I'm using this, I call it SDF shading, um, but uh, you could also just call it like gradient shading or like object shading. Um, this is essentially, you're just like, it lives in the shader, you're just taking an empty, you're making things a certain color within the bounds of that empty and you can move it around and do whatever you want with it. Um, it's pretty, pretty useful. If I can play the video, here's a, here's a really good a really good look at how it works because you can take these like I just have all these shapes and these are all rigged to a separate rig that is connected to the character, um, and you can just come in here and like paint some light in this area and then like paint some shadow in this area, um, and it just gives you a little bit of extra control where you need it when you need it. Oh, so that's how it plays. Oh, okay, cool. Um, another method of doing this, uh, nor of doing the sh this shadow control, uh, we're calling it vertex skeleton normal mapping, patent pending. <laughs> no, we, we need a new name. Um, this is actually a uh, thanks to Dylan Gu's team for pioneering this. Um, it uses geometry nodes essentially to take the normals from a chain of vertices with no faces that like go throughout the body. Um, and it's basically just doing a cylinder projection onto every piece of the body from there. Uh, you can see like in the after over there, you have really, really clean edges as the lights kind of rotate around the body as opposed to the kind of gloopy edges in the other one. This is still super experimental for us. Um, I think it could be really useful for us to create LOD sh shadows in the future. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep working on it. That's why this is just a mannequin because we haven't actually implemented it. Um, this is another super useful thing. Shadow meshes, AKA screen space shadows, basically you're using a mesh to define where or to project where a shadow is going to appear on a character. So here we're using it on a character's bangs, like to get the shadow on her like this. Um, you can make this just in base blender super easy with a refraction BSDF. There are other ways to do it in Goo Engine that I think are a little bit more elegant. Um, elegant. Um, but you can see like it's just a it's, a, it's a mesh. Like when the wireframe is on, you can see that there is a mesh there, but uh, it is invisible unless it is seeing a color through it, uh, a specific color. Uh, the, and you can think of it like, like chroma keying, um, where you give it an input color and you tell it, take this color and wherever this color is, make it this color. Pretty simple. So we're looking for obviously the skin tone of the character and then we make it the shadow skin tone of the character. So we recently uh, adopted Blender Studio's Cloud Rig as our rigging solution. It's extremely procedural and it has a ton of features built specifically for NPR. This is the rig that they developed for, um, I think on Sprite Fright, um, and, but definitely for Coffee Run and for Wing It. Um, and we spent a lot of time building our own meta rig based on all of the cloud rig tools that lines up perfectly with our character topology. And now we can procedurally generate as many character rigs as we need in a many, like, a, a, many sizes and proportions. Um, not just bodies, but faces too. Huge thank you to Demeter Zadik. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name, but uh, we love Cloud Rig at our studio. I watched all your training videos with my rigging artist. We learned a ton. Um, this is a Cloud Rig feature just to show you a little bit kind of the tools that come like pre-built in it. This is just a lattice modifier. It's a, 
This is another like really good example of a go anywhere, do anything, get out of jail free card transformer. Um, you can. Use, this isn't just like kind of a, a cheek puff control. You could because it can translate almost anywhere. This is a free like fix the silhouette of the character control or like a you know turn the move the the eye a little bit over here control or you know you can just do a smear control. Really really good for smears. Amazing for smears. Um, continuing on with lattices, this is the flattest. Uh, this is really, really helpful. You might look at this and say like, why do you need to squish your character's head like this? Um, but it is very important, and I, I promise, I'll show you, hang on, in this video, which I will play for you, I think it's a really good example of why we would use a flattest. So in this shot, Obviously, we're on a we're really close to the character. We're on a really wide lens. We're like maybe like 20 millimeters or something or less. Um, and you can see kind of as I toggle it, you can see like the face just kind of like jumps out at you a little bit extra. Um, the flattest really helps keep all of the features of the face proportional to each other. Um, that's huge when you're talking about you know a character where the only things on the face you're seeing are the eyes and the mouth, and maybe the nose has like a line on it, right? Um, See, so here's the final version of that shot. Isn't she pretty? So we also use lattices on cars, um, because cars move, they, got, they, have, they have to go fast. Um, and we don't render with motion blur, so how do we get the feeling of like zoom without like blur? Um, well, actually, lattices are super awesome, and they're really, really fun to use on cars uh, because you just you know you stretch it, you create those smears. Um, it's uh, it's it's a good time. Uh, profiles are kind of I would say they're, they're kind of notoriously difficult to achieve, and especially in 3D. Um, talking about like anime, like the side mouth kind of look, right? Um, not every anime art style will lean into it as heavily as others, but um, we really wanted the ability and the malleability in our rigs to push this to the extreme as much as possible. So here, what we actually are doing is as the character's mouth rotates to the side so that we can animate it on the side, we're bringing in a proxy mesh that kind of covers this kind of area here so that you can still have preserved the nice silhouette of like the lips um, on the side and it still looks natural. Uh, here it is in action, just to prove that it works. Y'all are a tough crowd. <laughs> I think this is pretty cool. <laughs> Here's another example. We're testing against reference, obviously like these are really, really unrealistic like proportions that we're working with here, so we're seeking out like the most stylized reference that we can. Like we were looking at Kill a Kill right, right there. We were looking at Evangelion right here. Like we're trying to um, push the bounds of like the shapes you can make with just with a mouth as much as possible. So speaking of animation, um, on one of our previous projects, I already talked about. I already I already mentioned Colorville. Um, I specifically learned a very valuable lesson about stepping animation on that project. Colorville was a project where we animated in Maya. We brought everything into Blender in Alembics. And once I had the, all of that baked animation, I was like, it needs to look more 2D. And I just cut everything to twos. I just like baked it all to twos globally. Uh, and that resulted in a lot of lost keyframes, like the actual where the stepping would skip over a key pose entirely. Um, and be, even beyond that, we decided to, or we were using a decent amount of motion capture on that project, which then with the stepping resulted in even muddier animation. So that was a learning experience. But on Samurai Blue, we knew something had to change. And from the get go, I encouraged the animators to step everything on their own manually. Um, I ended up directing entirely on instinct, just telling the animators like, chop a frame here, or like, you know, we, uh, needs another breakdown here, um, and just going completely by feeling. Um, and otherwise, I would just kind of tell them, like, this is a mixed frame rate style, anything goes, mainly twos, threes are okay, if you think you can hold something for fours, go for it. Um, fast motions on ones, maybe, sometimes, not all the time, if it feels right, yeah, cool. 
Um, everyone did things a little bit differently. We don't have a standard practice, I would say, for stepping animation. Um, some animators would start from stepped breakdowns and then spline it perfectly, and then they would bake everything, go in and just delete all the keyframes that they didn't need. Um, I personally, I start from spline or like linear, and then I'll use the interpolation to grab a kind of a breakdown pose, and then I will step it, and then I'll adjust my breakdown manually. Um, and that, that's a lot of kind of switching between stepped and linear for me, but it, it works, you know? Um, just a reminder that while you're also making all of those decisions about timing and spacing, you're also like, you're not really working in real 3D space. Like, I think it was a year ago that the BTS right there from Encanto went viral, uh, showing just how crazy characters look when posed for the camera. Um, I'd like to raise them, <laughs> me posing Yoko's face. Um, it's, here's, here's, here's a really good example. It looks pretty good. What is that abomination? <laughs> Um, so, kind of in that vein, we decided like we can't use mouth bags, especially if we're trying to achieve really large mouth shapes because you start to run into issues with clipping and after a certain point you're like, oh my gosh, I spent like an, two hours just cleaning up the way that the, the teeth look in this shot because the mouth bag was clipping them um, and there has to be a better solution. The solution is no mouth bag, you don't need it. Right now what we do is we shade, we grab the back facing of the character's head and we just shade it the mouth color. Or like the internal mouth color, keep it shadeless. Super easy. Um, AOVs are the best thing ever. I love AOVs. Who knows what an AOV is? Does anybody use them? Arbitrary output variables. Awesome, y'all are the real ones. Um, arbitrary output variables, you can kind of think of it as like a, um, as like, a, as like a view layer or like an extra render pass control kind of thing. Um, we use several of them. Obviously you get the combined pass for free, that just comes with your render. Um, but then I also export a toon shading mask, which is basically a black and white mask of where the shadows are, where the lit areas are, where the, where the shadows are. Um, and then an index pass, which is super important for isolating different objects on the character. Basically every object on the character is given a value. It, you can make it all, all different colors if you want. I just use like black and white because you know that's usually enough on a character. Uh, it's just given a random grayscale value. Um, I also, I like to render, this is just a stylistic thing, you, you, don't, you don't need it, but I like a soft edge light pass. Basically it's just a dedicated edge light pass. Um, and I manipulate that further in comp. Um, and then there's a global, global cast shadows uh, pass, which is, only isolated to the character. Um, it's kind of the same thing as what you would get if you just checked the shadows box in the, view, in the render pass uh, settings. But also it's not because I'm using like its own light group. So, but it is global, um, but it's not. Um, basically it's just, it's its own thing that doesn't have other certain lights affecting it. Um, so, AOVs are really kind of hard to work with at scale in like a big film production right now, just because you have to go in and you have to type a name for the AOV in the shader. And then when you go to render, you have to go find the AOV box and the render passes and you have to type that name again. And if you misspell it or you miss a capitalization, you're out of luck. Blender will not render it. Um, so we partnered with Palette Tools for pipeline development and production management, and they helped us create this super helpful script, which automatically adds all the AOVs present in a scene at the click of a button. Um, so, since we have upwards of like four or five AOVs per character, uh, this is a godsend for us. Um, Palette is currently making some really cool production tracking software targeted at like indie animation studios. So y'all should definitely go check them out. They're pretty cool. Uh, so I'm starting to get into compositing a little bit here. Here's just an example of some of all of the different passes that go into a shot. Here is the shot that we just looked at. This is just the combined pass. So you can see the character doesn't even look like she's like in the same world as the rest of the environment. But now this is the final, the final look and it looks really, really cool. Um, so compositing lightning round. <laughs> Because I, I don't have a whole lot of time left and I don't want to 
make this an After Effects talk at a Blender convention. Um, I do do all my compositing in After Effects, um, but I'll just briefly show you a little bit of the specific, some specific kind of After Effects specific things I do um, to just kind of show you a little bit about like, you know, what, what you can do, what's out there for comp. Um, first of all, this is super useful. You can basically export any camera in a Blender scene. Um, uh, this add-on basically makes it a JSX, and then you can import that into After Effects. It makes a new composition with just all the like perfect 3D tracked camera data that you possibly need, and then you just you know combine that with your other comp with all your your footage layers, your, all your EXRs and everything, and you just it just lines up perfectly. You have like a free, perfect 3D analog of your camera from Blender in After Effects. It's very, it's very handy, especially if you have a giant moving camera scene where you need to put a bunch of different things in the, in the view. Um, after a certain point, you're like, why aren't I just doing all of these things in 3D? Um, which is valid. Moving on. <laughs> Pixel sorting, so we used this glitchy stylized kind of effect for motion blur, specifically on the ghost car in the film. Uh, it looks really cool. I don't know if there's a way to do it in Blender, um, but even if there was, um, I really like that just having the control of comp, you know, at this stage. I'm not trying to go into edit mode on any meshes. I'm not trying to change any animation. I'm just trying to achieve the look. Um, and this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a pretty cool look. Uh, bokeh is a really cool thing, especially since, again, this is like a film that happens at night. You're talking a wide open aperture on your camera lens. So I went for this really pretty uh, bokeh that we hand drew, again, in Photoshop, uh, kind of inspired by like an anamorphic look. And this is just a nice little After Effects effect. You just, you know, you put it you put it in, it makes all of the highlights look, you know, like, like what you drew right there. And you can use any image in the corner down there. You can see like the little starburst image, like, and then there it is. It's like all a bunch of different little starbursts. So that's just another fun little way to uh, inject some stylization into your images. If you saw uh, like Speed Racer from 2009, there's like the, a part where uh, Speed and Trixie kiss and all of the bokeh turns into hearts. Like that's what I'm talking about. Uh, 2D effects. So one of these days, I'll meet an actual 2D animator that knows how to use grease pencil. Um, but all of them know how to use Toon Boom. So until then, um, I will get 2D deliverables of just PNG sequences from them, and then I will add them in comp, and I'll do other little, you know, glows and uh, other little effects to make them pop and make them all cool. Um, Sometimes I'll also do even more detailed 2D effects or like make painted FX cards in Photoshop. Like um, for fog and stuff, I really like taking a cloud brush in Photoshop and just going like wah in a document just to make a black and white mask that I can take into a After Effects file. I'll grab the depth pass from Blender and I'll luma mat them on top of each other so that I have what looks like you know, hand-painted fog, but like it's kind of acting and interacting with all the characters in the environment in three dimensions. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So final breakdown here, coming back to the shot that I said we would get we'd, all the way back to, um, I'm going to go through really briefly all the different layers in this shot. So here is the isolated character pass, just base color. Um, you can see she doesn't have any color correction. It's just the lit and the shadow. Um, this is even more basic, just the lit in the shadow. You'll also see, like, while it's mainly black and white, and I said it was black and white earlier, but I lied, because her eye lights are red, because I need to be able to isolate those and make those glow, because that just adds a lot more life to the character. Because light glows, right? That's how it feels like light, um, at least when you're talking about comp. This is essentially the color correction pass, and while it's really hard to tell, um, I'm basically just taking this, and then turning all of it kind of a really deep blue, blurring it, and then matting it back against itself. And what that creates is sort of the illusion of light wrap, which is a fun kind of stylized way to signal to the audience subliminally that there's this big like screen behind her, and she's kind of shading it. Um, then we've got, this is that soft edge light pass, separate from the thing we just did, that was light wrap. This is like an actual edge light on the character from 3D. What I like to do with that thing is go in and I'll have like a, an actual rim light right here. Like a, this is the rim light 
right there, and then I'll like mask them against each other so that that rim light feels like it's more directional. You can do that in Blender itself, just like in the shader, but um, I decided not to because I knew I would make a lot of these decisions on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, and since I can't manipulate the materials themselves in a linked pipeline, uh, shot by shot, like it would just take too long and um, mess up my library overrides and everything. I just decided I'll just export both of those passes and do them in comp because it's super easy just to alpha math something onto something else. Um, then we've got, because that, that projector, remember, that, the, uh, that our concept art has to go on. So that has to be its own map because there's an environment behind there. That's just a black and white pass with an alpha cutout for the character. Uh, normally that like in 3D, the projector just looks like that, but because of us, we can actually like put a thing back there. Um, and that scene is just rendered entirely separately from another uh, blend. And finally, you get the final shot. So thank you so much for listening. Um, Samurai Blue After Image is screening tonight in the Suzanne Awards. I hope to see you there, please. It'd be awesome. Um, if you can't make it, you can scan the QR code. Um, and that's where you can kind of reach me online if you have any questions. Or I'll find me around the, find me around the conference. I'll answer questions in person, too. <laughs> yeah, thank you.